Now, there is nothing more pompous than false humility. Many people who consider themselves truth seekers and spiritual are filled with it. They often use religious terms to express themselves. They will say, I am nothing, but the Spirit of God moves through me, and if I do any good, it is because of God's Spirit and not my own. Or, I have no ability of my own, only the power of God has any ability. Now, in those terms, you are the power of God manifested. You are not powerless. To the contrary, through your being, the power of God is strengthened, for you are a portion of what he is. You are not simply an insignificant, innocuous clump of lay through which he decides to show himself. You are he, manifesting as you. You are as legitimate as he is. If you are a part of God, then he is also a part of you, and in denying your own worth, you end up denying his as well. I do not like to use the term, quote-unquote, he, meaning God, since all that is is the origin of not only all sexes, but of all realities, in some of which sex as you think of it does not exist. Affirmation is the spontaneous motion of the body as it dances. Many churchgoers who consider themselves quite religious do not understand the nature of love or affirmation as much as some bar patrons who celebrate the nature of their bodies and enjoy the spontaneous transcendence as they let themselves go with the motion of their beings. True religion is not repressive as life itself is not. When Christ spoke, he did so in the context of his times, using the symbolism and vocabulary that made sense to a particular people in a particular period of history in your terms. He began with their beliefs, and using their references, tried to lead them into freer realms of understanding. With every translation, the Bible has changed its meaning, being interpreted in the language of the times. Christ spoke in terms of good and bad spirits because these represented the people's beliefs. In their terms, he showed them that quote-unquote bad spirits could be vanquished, but these were then symbols accepted as realities by the people, sometimes for quite quote-unquote normal diseases and human conditions. The very term, love your neighbor as yourself, was an ironic statement, for in that society no man loved his neighbor, but distrusted him heartily. Much of Christ's humor has been lost, therefore. In the Sermon on the Mount, the meek shall inherit the earth, has been grossly misinterpreted. Christ meant, you form your own reality. Those who think thoughts of peace will find themselves safe from war and dissension. They will be untouched by it. They will escape, and indeed inherit the earth. Thoughts of peace, particularly in the middle of chaos, take great energy. People who can ignore the physical evidence of wars and purposely think thoughts of peace will triumph. But in your terminology, the word quote-unquote meek has come to mean spineless, inadequate, lacking energy. In Christ's time, the phrase about the meek inheriting the earth implied the energetic use of affirmation, of love, and peace. As mentioned in Seth's speak, the Christ entity was too great to be contained in any one man, or for that matter, in any one time. So the man you think of as Christ was not crucified, nor was the idea of self-sacrifice then involved. The myth became more quote-unquote real than the physical event, which of course is the case in many so-called important historical events. But even the myth was distorted. God did not sacrifice his dearly beloved son by allowing that son to be physical. The Christ entity desired to be born in space and time, to straddle creaturehood in order to serve as a leader and to translate certain truths in physical terms. Each of you survived death. The man who was crucified knew this beyond all doubt, and he sacrificed nothing. The quote-unquote substitute was a personality seemingly deluded, but in his delusion he knew that each person is resurrected. He took it upon himself to become the symbol of this knowledge. The man called Christ was not crucified. In the overall drama, however, it made little difference what was fact in your terms and what was not, for the greater reality transcends facts and creates them. You have free will. You could interpret the drama as you wished. It was given to you. 
its great creative power still exists, and you use it in your own way, even changing your own symbolism as your beliefs change. But the main idea is the affirmation that the physical being, the self that you know, is not annihilated with death. This comes through even in the distortions. The whole concept of God the Father, as given by Christ, was indeed a quote-unquote New Testament. The male image of God was used because of the sex orientation of the times, but beyond this, the Christ personality said, the kingdom of God is within you. In a certain way, the Christ personality was a manifestation of the evolution of consciousness, leading the race beyond the violent concepts of the times and altering behavior that had prevailed to that time. In terms of time, evolution as you think of it, emerging consciousness had come to the point where it delighted so in distinctions and differences that even in small geographical areas, multitudinous groups, cults, and nationalities were assembled, each proudly asserting its own individuality and worth over the others. In the beginning, in those terms, man's emerging consciousness needed the freedom to disperse itself, to become different, to originate bases for various characteristics and assert individuations. By Christ's time, however, some principle of unity was necessary by which this diversification would also experience a sense of unity and feel its oneness. Christ was the symbol of man's emerging consciousness, holding within himself the knowledge of man's potential. His message was meant to be carried beyond the times, but this interpretation is often not made. Christ uses parables that were applicable then. He used priests as symbols of authority. He turned water into wine, yet many who consider themselves quite holy ignore Christ at the wedding feast and think any alcoholic beverage degrading. He quote-unquote consorted with prostitutes and the poor, and his disciples were hardly men that could be called the city fathers. Yet many who consider themselves religious people hold on to respectability most of all. Christ used the vernacular of the times, and in his own way spoke out against dogmatic ideas, as well as temples that pretended to be repositories of holy knowledge, but were instead concerned with money and prestige. Yet many who consider themselves followers of Christ now turn against the outcasts that he himself considered brothers and sisters. He affirmed the reality of the individual over any organization while still realizing that some system was necessary. His whole message was that the exterior world is the manifestation of the interior one, that the quote-unquote kingdom of God is made flesh. There are indeed two gospels written by men in other countries in that time relating to Christ's unknown life, to episodes not given in the Bible. These formed a quite separate framework of knowledge that could be accepted by people who had different beliefs than the Jews at the time. The messages were given in other terms, but again, they reflected the affirmation of the self and its continued existence after physical death. Love was always stressed. One of the Gospels is a counterfeit. That is, it was written after the others, and the events twisted to make it appear that some of them happened in a completely different context than they did. Regardless, Christ's message was one of affirmation. At the time, Christ united man's consciousness in ways that reached out into history. The Christ consciousness was not isolated. I am speaking in your terms now. The same consciousness gave birth to all of your religions, therefore, the various frameworks through which the peoples of different times could express themselves and grow. In all cases, the religions began with the beliefs prevailing, spoke through the dictums of the times, and then expanded. Now, this represents the spiritual side of man's evolution. The idea frameworks of psychic and mental life were far more important than the physical aspects as the species grew and changed. Affirmation then means the loving acceptance of your own unique individuality. It may involve denial, where you refuse to accept the visions or dogmas of others in order to more clearly perceive and form your own. Such affirmation will lead you to your own inner discoveries and attract from the deepest portions of your being the particular kind of information, experience, and perception that you need. The loving acceptance of yourself 
will allow you to ride through beliefs as you would through the changing characteristics of a countryside. The more a belief encourages you to use your abilities and vitality, then the more affirmative it is. Rupert's perception is highly altered this evening, and this is an example of certain kinds of both affirmation and denial. He has always emphasized his own unique creative and intuitive processes. In so doing, he denied many of the concepts believed in by others. He accepted the belief that any consciousness could be in some kind of direct intimate contact with experiences and realities usually not perceived but ignored. He knew there were many different ways of experiencing even the physical world, and so he rejected all concepts that told him otherwise. The very belief allowed him to use those abilities, and as muscles become more resilient with use, so do psychic and intuitive powers. The legs run and leap over areas of ground. They cannot themselves interpret the reality beneath them. The feet are not aware of the ants they crush. They may feel the grass or sidewalk or the road, but the peculiar individual sensate life of the grass itself or of the ant escapes the feet, which are involved in their own reality and concerned with these other things only in their relationship to feethood. The mind can interpret the experiences that the legs and the feet have, however, and by imaginatively using the sensual data can perceive the ant's reality to some extent. Now, when the mind races and runs, it sometimes has great difficulty interpreting its activities to the brain, which is usually concerned with other realities only to the extent that they impinge upon it. Now, Rupert's mind is far more aware of other realities than his brain is, but he consciously believes in the greater reality of himself and his perceptions. The brain also possesses this belief, and so it opens itself as much as possible to the mind's activities. Because it does, certain intuitive, psychic, and quote-unquote intellectually spacious experiences can be physically felt to some extent. The knowledge is interpreted through alterations in body sensation, which give it an important corporeal validity. In such cases, high mental and psychic activity is reflected in the body's experience, providing a beneficial unity. Here I have used the term spacious for workings of the mind and intuitions that exist in what you might call an accelerated range of action. The normal intellect, oriented so precisely by beliefs to the inevitability of a one-focused kind of perception, is limited. A certain kind of affirmation of self allows the brain to tune into these more spacious methods of perception that are the natural characteristics of the mind. There are very good reasons why this type of assertion must first occur. The brain and the entire physical system is meant to ensure your bodily survival and to follow your conscious beliefs about reality. There is always a harmonious unifying connection between your beliefs and activities. Some people feel utterly confident in certain areas and are timorous in others. Some aspects of life may be ignored or even refuted for a time while others are focused upon. The individual will very cleverly and shrewdly go ahead in those areas in which he or she feels safe, often when in the process of altering beliefs. You will not use your spacious mind until you affirm its reality within yourself and until you are ready to handle the additional data which will then become consciously available to one extent or another. But the spacious mind operates through your creaturehood. In your terms, it represents latent abilities of consciousness that can be more or less normal functions. There are built-in biological structures that are activated for the reception of such messages, and they have always been a part of your physical nature as a species. They will not be triggered on a personal basis until your own beliefs allow you to perceive the multidimensional layers of your own experience, or at least accept the possibilities.